after five years of captivity in Afghanistan, do not expect Bo Bergdahl to rejoin his family anytime soon. In fact, the road home to Haley, Idaho, could be long and very difficult. Experts say several steps are crucial for Bergdahl to successfully uh, re-enter society. First of all, he needs proper medical care to document the effects of captivity. He will also need psychological support as he comes to terms with what he has been through. At the same time, government and military officials need to debrief him for any useful intelligence. And finally, Bergdahl will need the support, of course, of his family, his loved ones, as he goes home. Air Force Colonel Lee Ellis spent more than five years in prisoner of war camps during the Vietnam War. And he joins me now in studio. And he's also the author of Leading with Honor. Colonel, pleasure and honor to meet you. Thank you. Just so you were 24 when you were taken down enemy fire. Mm -hmm. You were in multiple different camps right. for five plus years. Right. However many years later we are here in 2014, what, what are your most vivid memories of that time? I think there's, first of all, there's a the fear once you're captured. Until I was captured, I was a cool customer doing my training and everything trying to evade. But once captured, there was fear. And then there was a settling in of, okay, I'm going to be here a while. I've got to fall back on my training and my commitments and live day to day. And really, we just live day to day. The most important thing for us, which Bergdahl didn't have, was other people around us. And even those that were in isolated cells, we had contact. We would risk our lives to reach someone in, in uh, solitary confinement and say, hey, man, we're with you. What's your name? And when did you get shot down? And we're glad, you, we're glad you're with us, and uh, we're going to take care of you, that kind of thing. Were you tortured? Yes. 95% of the POWs in Vietnam were tortured at one time or another. Now, I was a junior-ranking guy, so I faced that less often uh, than the senior people and the senior leaders. They always went to the leaders and tried to break them, thinking that would enable us. Or re then we would fall in line and break all so easily. Of course, it didn't work that way. How, at the worst moments, how bad did it get? Well, how bad did it get? We were always hungry and uh, hot in the summer and cold in the winter, sometimes isolated and lonely, thinking about families. Uh, I was not married at the time, so that was a big relief for me not to have wife and kids to worry about. But I think for me the, the worst day in my life there was the day, uh, first time I was tortured and I was laying on this filthy floor in uh, leg irons and handcuffs and I'd finally given in to do something. They wanted me to fill out a three-page biography. And, of course, name, rank, service, number, date of birth, those are the four we gave them automatically. But the only other thing I gave them that was true was my father's first and last name. The rest of it was all false, but I still felt so weak. I felt like I'd not been strong enough to deny them what they wanted, which was just me to submit. Mm. I'd had to submit, and I felt so weak. I felt like I was the worst person ever worn the uniform. Mm. Of course, later I find out that everybody went through that. Mm. Everybody eventually gave them something. They wouldn't let you die, and they could make you do something. It just had to, because of saving face, you had to give them something sooner or later. And, uh, but we didn't give them what they wanted, uh, which was our cooperation. They wanted us to make statements against the war and all that sort of stuff, and we fought it every day. You made it home? Yes, yes. What was that first night in your own bed like? Well, first of all, we, we flew to Clark Air Base and spent two days there in a hospital. Not much sleep. I mean, we were like kids on a sugar high. You know, we were excited and not much sleep there. Did make a phone call home to mom and dad. Then we flew back to the United States, and uh, John McCain and I were shot down and captured 11 days apart. He mm. went in October 27th. I was November the 7th. Mm. So we came back on the same airplane. We flew into Montgomery. Then he, his, the airplane took him on to Jacksonville. And then my parents were there to meet me. So my parents and my brother and his family, and that was a really exciting experience. They stayed for about three days. They went home, and I had to stay two weeks for debrief and <sighs> physicals. It was exciting, but yet I have read how you said, as a POW over all that time, you shut down. Yes. You shut down emotionally, spiritually, right. mentally, except you're angry, yeah. right? But yeah. how did, how did, you hear you have family members and loved ones coming at you. Did yeah. you even know how to respond? That was difficult, and we did shut down. I did emotionally, and my emotions were like that table. I couldn't get excited about being released. I wasn't, and I couldn't get depressed about being there. At that point, I'd learned to manage my emotions and just shut them down, except for anger. And I think the last couple of years, when it was more live and let live, we started to shed our anger and get rid of the bitterness because we wanted to come home healthy. Mm -hmm. 
And I, we didn't shut down spiritually, though. We did shut down emotionally, but intellectually was a, probably the most stimulating time, time of my life. How long did it take you to finally be normal again? Colonel? I'm not normal now. <laughs> You're not normal now, <laughs> truly. Well, yes, we are. Uh, I don't know. That's hard to say. I know that uh, we didn't think we had any problems. In fact, when we came home, one of the things I was thinking about Bo coming home, uh, we thought the society had gone to hell in a handbasket. There were no drugs in schools in Commerce, Georgia when I left to go overseas. And I come home and there are drugs in the middle school. So there was a lot of things that had gone downhill, a lot of th good things that happened. Mm -hmm. But we felt like that we knew what we were doing because we had been managing ourselves pretty tightly for a long time, very disciplined by that experience. And uh, so people were whining about, all, you know, they didn't have enough color TVs or they didn't have a CB radio for their pickup. Get truck. over it, you're saying. And so we came home with an attitude of gratitude. Of course. Oh, uh, even still, when I get in my bed at night, and it's Still, a cold night out. So many decades later. 41 years later since I came home, I'm so thankful to have a warm bed at night. Mm. And in the summertime, to have a cool air conditioned house and to have a good meal in a refrigerator with food. Uh, it's, it, we live in a wonderful country. Do you ever have flashbacks to this day, or is that done? I don't think I have flashbacks. Occasionally, something will hit me emotionally. Uh, you know, movies can go under your emotional radar. And, uh, and hit you. And so I've actually been able to get in touch with my emotions through movies more than anything else. Books and movies, because they kind of slip up on you and all of a sudden, I remember uh, when I saw Gladiator the second time, oh, and this time me. I was really watching it, when they, and when they said, she said, honor this man, he was a Roman soldier, I lost it. <sighs> I just thought of all my buddies who didn't come home that we left you know, we lost there, and I really was able to grieve their loss then. Colonel Lee Ellis, leading with honor, thank you so much. It is my honor to meet you. Thank you for coming in. Thank you, Brooke. Enjoy being with you today. Thank you.